Good morning, everyone. Please listen with the motivation of bodhicitta, which is the thought that all beings throughout space must achieve perfect Buddhahood, and that it is in order to bring that about that you will listen to and practice the profound and holy Dharma. ネピカカプタボイナヤセレンワタンネメバタンパチニワタンサンバトンカレンバタンジテンドプチバンダボチゴウヨレマドナサタドハタチンゲンタンカンゲラソバンガナソロゴウヨマリステンデンテンダボチ
ตันเดจสงยอดตัดเตยนดกาวสลมิกเสกตัดโตเซมเตลาตากบยอดิเซมยมองเกวันตุชุนเนตัมเมเกเวเลกวาลันเซมตังลุงะญีลาตัดเต
ตะเกลาเซนิกลาซอบเกตอนเนตะเกลันแคบันดาเวตุกาวตะทวาเรเตยินดุกาวสลามองเดกวันดะชอนเนตะนิขอรังเอ่อขอรังมองเดกวันด
aspects to dharma, two types of dharma. And these are what we could call a mundane or worldly dharma and supramundane or transcendent dharma. Mundane dharma is how we acquire the things we want and need uh, in this life. Through our karma, uh, we've been born in this world, and there are certain things we want. We want longevity, we want good health, we want a reasonable degree of affluence, and we want success in whatever we choose to do with our lives. We don't want short lives filled with illness, afflicted by poverty, and constant disaster. So, even these things, which are certainly mundane, have to come from a cause. And the only possible cause of getting what we want is having behaved in a certain way in previous lives. There is a saying, if you want to know what you did in the past, look at your body now. If you want to know what you'll be in the future, look at what you're doing now. We can infer from the fact that we've been born with human bodies, access to Dharma, and so on, that in past lives we did a great deal of good, very little bad, and uh, observed some type of moral discipline, since that is the only karmic cause of this type of human rebirth. And as a result of those actions, we have an amazing opportunity in this life. But whether or not we will continue to enjoy this degree of prosperity, this type of opportunity, depends on what we do now. And especially we need to take responsibility for our own minds. Because we must accept that what we do with our minds, in the end, determines what we do with our speech and our bodies. To put it bluntly, we need to make sure that we don't drown in the swamp of our own kleshas. We need to apply remedies to these kleshas, which we all have. And we need to uh, practice the teachings involving our bodies, speech, and minds. We call body, speech, and mind the three gates because they are the gates or avenues through which we interact with the world around us. They therefore are also gates to potential disaster if we misuse them and gates to liberation if we use them well. We need to use our intelligence to examine our own minds and what we are doing with our bodies and speech. Principally, we need to look at our minds because our minds are in charge. Our bodies and speech are like automobiles and our mind is like the driver. Everything we do starts with some kind of thought, some kind of motivation in our mind. It's for this reason that among all the things the Buddha taught, by far the most emphasized is bodhicitta. Because more than anything else, bodhicitta is the key to actual transformation of our minds. As was written by Shantideva, one instance generation of bodhicitta forever transforms the most benighted of sentient beings into a child of the Buddhas, worthy of the veneration of this world, of all in this world, including its gods. If 
we allow our minds to harbor glaciers without any effort to change, then naturally, sooner or later, our bodies and speech will act out those glaciers. And we will continue uh, to experience some sorrow. If, on the other hand, we introduce bodhicitta into our mind, if we generate the sincere intention to bring all beings without exception to a state of perfect liberation and perfect awakening, then we turn our minds toward the achievement of that awakening. That aspiration is important. But we also have to realize that we are still in samsara, and therefore we cannot, right now, bring other beings to Buddhahood. So therefore, in order to implement that aspiration, we have to resolve to enter the path trod by all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and through doing so, achieve a state ourselves that will give us the ability to bring all beings to Buddhahood. When we generate that type of implementation bodhicitta, because we are consciously resolving, vowing, to emulate all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, we naturally become fully open to their blessings. And this is a source of unimaginable power to actually help other beings. When we listen to Dharma, it is not enough that what we hear pleases us. It is not enough that we enjoy the experience, that on a social level it is gratifying, we feel comfortable, we enjoy it. When we listen to Dharma, we are doing it in order to learn something practical. Something that we can use to change. To cleanse our minds of whatever flaws afflict us. In order to achieve perfect wisdom. What we are attempting to do or begin when we listen to Dharma is not a hobby. It is not uh, some kind of project that we will complete in whatever spare time we have in one year. It's a project that cannot even be measured in lifetimes. We can't say it'll take me a hundred or a thousand or a billion lifetimes to do this. We have no idea. It's a very gradual and very long climb up a very, very long staircase. If we see it that way, we will get the most out of the teachings. The teachings themselves, as you know, of course, come in all kinds of formats commentaries and texts of practical instruction, songs, even memoirs. The point of most of them is inspiration, and that comes from faith. But we have a problem uh, with faith, because we have a dream, an expectation about what faith is, that doesn't fit the facts, and especially doesn't fit the facts in this 21st century. We dream or imagine that faith is just going to happen to us, like some kind of instantaneous, mind-blowing infatuation with a charismatic llama that will be swept off our feet in an instant and never have any questions, never have any doubts, never have any problems. 
If it was ever that way, it certainly isn't nowadays. In this 21st century, blind faith, and obviously what I just described would be a case of abject blind faith, is hopefully less prevalent than it used to be. Nowadays, we're all highly educated, by which I mean we're trained in critical thinking, in the faculty of critical examination and evaluation, and we all grow up learning the scientific method. This gives us a problem because we tell ourselves, I want to feel faith and I want to feel it right now, but I'm not feeling it because I'm not convinced. It's fine that you're not convinced. Do not be in any hurry to accept the truth of Dharma. Do not be in any hurry to believe or be a true believer. And don't try to rush faith. Don't try to induce it. The Buddha taught that we should examine his teachings with as much critical rigor as we would involve in chemically testing gold, supposed gold, before buying it. Faith, only good faith, genuine faith, only comes from personal experience. The wondrous qualities of the three jewels, the Buddhas, Dharma, and Sangha, and the wondrous attributes of the result or fruition of this path have to be learned gradually. And as you gradually gain reason in your own experience to believe in these things, you will gradually, naturally develop informed faith. This does not happen suddenly, and it does not happen through some kind of brainwashing or induction. It has to be a natural, healthy, gradual, and organic process of growth, a growth of appreciation and understanding, like the way a seed turns into a shoot, which eventually develops leaves and petals and fruit and so on. Each level of, of understanding becomes the cause of another level of appreciation. And in that way, in the manner of cause and result, which as we know is how everything works anyway, faith gradually develops. And that type of faith is stable. It is certainty. Because it is developed gradually and in a healthy way based on your own experience. Until that starts to arise, it's enough just to be open-minded. You can pray for the blessings that faith arise in you, if you wish. Pray for the purification of whatever veils obscure you. Pray, certainly, for realization of the true nature of reality. But that, in the beginning, is sufficient. Sadjur 
Pajo Sando Lu Stande Jetangeta Gordon Nangla Jenny Mango Jigla Codo Soso La Tondo Mondo Mondo Song Chaja Chimbe Nello Ginyamne Sorigendo Zorembe Gabla Tasson Yabatin de Mambondos Tatondo de Singaran Sola ええ、こう、ま、そんさんべけてに、テソムタン。てに、ジルダボ Tell Te tato la rebe yendo she yung de mato chiketa, tanda lam san she goyagi yundi da bo yo mari. Neso tende da bo de tata yu lama no no chan salo sena tata sawa sena sosu ke ngone tane sato ke lama jayu na sento ke lama chik sena labi ke luso yori. Te yendo kaoso la tata tenge nelo nda wo sengu nelo nda wo te ngom me ding henge lama sawa nyende yo ma de tsame ki chue son ne te nelo nda wo te de ki yo de te ina yang lama chike kondi ne ta sori kendo la daan chue ki yo de te ngone semto ki lama chike sene se yung yo de te che du ta te ta wo yina sawa de te ne jupa se du kaoso la te ne rembe yendo ta yu yung me ki lama yung su zo ba tam che te la Chancellor, Dingboji jewa yena, dingboji togri, tamaji jewa yena, tamaji togri, kaya majeba yena, chaja chim, nello won't you be jibu tamba chepa to papa jigging more day than I adore and so took the one that won't get a mother kaya and talk about it. Then in the castle, Lord, you tell a thing, then the chaja chimbuke, nello surgeon, the trouble chavuke, lunga ye some gay, dip jung chepa to papa so gay. Tene Motola, that doji king you that was so ne, so young with capsula. Ta, you are me up a charger chimbu tending days. That charger chimbu nello yamnella so young with capsula takes a gum yamnen da voce in a yam takes and toss on da voce and dog yordi. Tay into capsula, cut a gog yordi senna, tenny, rang a same nello kind yimbate. But I'm not going to be able to get a lot of money. I'm not going to be able to get a lot of money. I'm not going to 
Tavat 
We're going through these songs uh, in order here, so for those of you who are following uh, in the book, we've reached page 86. And the song we come to, which does not have a title, but in English we have to give them titles, so we just gave it the title of its first line, I Salute the Root and Lineage Gurus. Um, this song is very brief. It only consists of around 12 lines. But um, it may be a little bit advanced in the sense that it appears to uh, be describing advice uh, given by Techen Baba Dorje to one of his disciples who uh, was at least receptive to a fairly uh, advanced level of instruction in Mahamudra. This does not mean that it is inappropriate for us uh, to study it. There is no harm in studying um, levels of the path that we have not reached. Because at the very least, since we are capable of conceptually understanding uh, things that we have not yet experienced, this will give us an idea of where we're headed. For example, knowing about um, what's far ahead of you on a staircase does not in any way prevent you from climbing up to reach it. It may in fact encourage you. So if you find that the advice or instruction provided in this song does not apply right now, to your experience in practice, uh, don't denigrate yourself. Don't say, well, I'm unworthy of this kind of explanation. I shouldn't even hear this. What am I doing here? It doesn't work that way. You're not unworthy of anything. The way it works is that even if you can't understand every aspect of it, you will be able to understand something. And it gives you a direction to head in, which is always a good thing. To go through the song line by line, the uh, first line is, I salute or I prostrate to the root and lineage gurus. Well, what is a root guru? There's a saying, you may have a hundred gurus who are bodhisattvas, who have achieved the levels. But you will only have one who breaks through your mind. Among all the gurus you have, one will be able to show you uh, your mind's nature. And that is a root guru. The others are kind gurus. They may be enlightened gurus. But they're not really your root guru. And the lineage gurus are the succession going from the root guru of your root guru and then the root guru of that guru and so on all the way back. The next line says, if my child you want to practice Mahamudra. The person being addressed here as we can infer from at the end of the song was a disciple of Terchambhava Dorje named Tashi Dundra, who requested instruction in Mahamudra. Because they were a close, because it was a loving relationship of teacher and disciple, he refers to him as my child. So he says, if you want to practice Mahamudra, so if you really want to do it, here is how. In the third line, he says, cultivate its preliminary devotion, Mahamudra. We always make a big deal 
out of the preliminaries. And we divide them and subdivide them and provide far more instruction on them than on anything else. But there is a good reason for this. Because Mahamudra is already there within you, waiting to be discovered, as it were, you can't create it. You have to unveil it. So therefore, a great deal of the practical discipline that leads to the discovery of Mahamudra is creating the conditions within your mind for it to be unveiled. And principle among all these conditions is devotion. So therefore, if we summarize all the preliminaries to Mahamudra in one phrase, they are devotion Mahamudra. The realization of Mahamudra through devotion. And this is why it's said, if you have tremendous devotion, you will automatically have tremendous Mahamudra meditation. If you have mediocre devotion, you will automatically have mediocre meditation. And if you have no devotion, you will automatically have no Mahamudra meditation. Trying to point out the nature of mind to somebody with no devotion is as pointless and frustrating an exercise as trying to stab your finger against solid stone. Nothing's going to get through. So the first thing is to cultivate the Mahamudra of devotion as a necessary preliminary. Well then what is the actual, if that's the preliminary, what's the actual thing? In the next line, the fourth line, he says, and the undistracted Mahamudra of this present awareness. What is the practice of Mahamudra? Well, in practical terms, it is a gradual process, of course, and it must begin with the cultivation of tranquility. Because as long as we do not have the ability to uh, remain free of distraction, we are not going to be able to uh, discover, let alone arrest in, our mind's natural state. But ultimately, the presence or absence of thought in and of itself is irrelevant to the practice of Mahamudra. Because if you can remain present, that is to say, if you can remain aware of the present moment of experience, then even if a hundred thoughts pass through your mind, it's irrelevant because you won't be distracted by them. To be distracted by a thought, thoughts will arise, but to be distracted by a thought, you must stray. You must be somehow captured by that thought, either because you mistakenly regard it as a special case, oh, this thought's important, I'd better follow it, or because you have the habit, as we all do, of simply following thought blindly and surrendering your autonomy to the thoughts that happen to flit through your mind. But if you don't do that, if you don't allow thoughts to capture you, the mere presence of a thought, the mere passing of a thought through your mind does not in itself impede or obstruct a present awareness. He defines, Tertian Bhavi Dorji defines what he means by present awareness in the fifth line when he says, the first moments unaltered freshness. The first moment here is very important because what we would call subsequent moments are not situations of direct experience. They are the conceptualization of a previous moment 
of direct experience. They are ideas about what we experienced a moment ago or several moments ago. Freshness means allowing your mind to not try to prolong the past. We spend most of our time either prolonging the past or beckoning the future. Every time we think about the future, plan for the future, we are beckoning the future. And every time we think about our own experience, even in the immediately preceding moment, we are pr trying to prolong the past. Now, you cannot really prolong the past. The past is past. But you can think about the past, and that is how you miss out on the present. So freshness means the mind of the immediate moment. In contrast, we would call conceptualization of a previous moment's experience stale mind. It's not fresh, it's not immediate, and it's not direct. Now, for freshness to be authentic, there has to be not only presence, but actual awareness. That is to say, there has to be authentic recognition that mind's fundamental attribute, awareness, must recognize and experience itself. If there is no such recognition, then it is not unaltered freshness, because in the absence of self-recognition, the mind, which is exploring itself, must turn to fabrication. In the absence of authentic recognition of itself, it will attempt to create something, to alter itself, to conform to some expectation. So therefore, he says, the first moment's unaltered freshness. In the sixth line, Tetran Bawe Dorje advises us to avoid certain things we might otherwise seek to do. Because we are meditating with a purpose, we are trying to recognize something, we become very anxious about how we're doing. And we start to think about it. So therefore, he says, don't settle, patch, alter, or speculate, is it or isn't it? Am I doing this right? Is this it? Most of these um, mistakes, which are mistakes simply because you're thinking about the meditation rather than doing it, most of these mistakes come from hoping for something better. You're hoping for something spectacular rather than ordinary, bare awareness. But in Mahamudra practice, you're not seeking the spectacular. In the next line, he says, don't split hairs in doubt. When we split hairs in doubt, when we try to micromanage and overanalyze, overthink our meditation, we are obviously thinking about it instead of doing it. Nevertheless, these thoughts, is it or isn't it, and so on, will arise. But they have to be dealt with exactly as we deal with any other thought that arises in meditation. They have no special status. They have no immunity to the way that we normally respond to thought. So what do we do? if such thoughts arise. In the eighth line, he says, relax within whatever arises, merely remaining present. If you relax within the uh, 
present moment of a thought arising, you're still present. We may think that when we follow thoughts, we are relaxed because we're used to doing it. It's habitual. But habitual and relaxed are not the same thing. For example, when a, a large sheaf or bundle of grass is tightly bound with a cord or one other piece of grass, that's habitual. That's not relaxed. But when someone just slices through the cord and the grass just flops and doesn't move, that's relaxed. In the next line, the ninth line, Tetran Baba Dorje says, do no more than that. Do, don't fix or alter anything. And this may be a challenge for us because, after all, we think that we're trying to fix ourselves. That's why we practice meditation. But you can't fix yourself by fixing yourself. Why does he say do no more than that? Because any more than that is thought. Conceptualization, micromanaging. And then the song ends with the colophon. He writes, this was quickly written by Barwe Dorje. Why quickly written? Because he didn't have to think about it. There's only one way to do this, and so he didn't have to think what to write, it's, it's this. For the disciple Tashi Dundrup, may self-arisen Mahamudra be quickly realized. Now this expression self-arisen applied to Mahamudra here has um, some importance. We imagine, or we may imagine, that Mahamudra is some kind of state that we are going to create. We are going to turn our minds into Mahamudra. But if it were a state that could be created, it would be impermanent and unreliable, in fact, pointless. A Mahamudra is self-arisen in the sense that we don't create it. No one created it. It's always there. That's what our mind actually is. And this is why preparation, preliminaries and so forth, purification practices, gathering the accumulation of merit and so on, why these things are so important. Because to a great extent, preparation is most of what we can do. We have to seek to discover something, unveil it. We can't create it. It's already there. Take it, Connor, long man, take it. Pick up a hammock and drape a cup of the lap, yalla, yingba. The neck or dana so shut on it and dog it. You should find yingba and do so need of tanking till I go yelling in the summer. Right. <laughs> 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 In a sense, I think that the, the way that we approach Mahamudra is a little bit like being a paleologist or archaeologist. When these people are uh, excavating, in the case of paleologists, uh, fossils, dinosaur bones and whatnot, in the case of archaeologists, really old stuff that people from 
thousands of years ago built or left behind. They're very, very careful. They, um, they won't even use, in most cases, metal tools. For the, they're, they're, they're brushing at these things. And they're very, very gradual. And they, they seek to gradually reveal them so that they don't alter or damage what is found beneath. And I think this is a little bit like the approach we take in the preliminary practices and the tranquility meditation, which are all preliminaries to Mahamudra. It's a very gentle process of gradually getting closer and closer to something and using finer and finer tools and being more and more gentle uh, so that you don't stray into alteration, which in the analogy would be damage of the fossils or the artifacts. Dana so the camera to budget to my aga to Nala, lonely lone dawa the dawa the pulvy pulvy to the day or it. Cut it to you, go yours and the budget to you. Nando got that one and done a teenager so I in a round and you'll be get the nature on Tom Jet the Tower, your net Tom Jet the Dem big same with Nero the Tonyo, your contagion car in the world. Actually, we, you know, we, we whine and complain a lot about the, the preliminaries and tranquility meditation, but it, these things are easy compared to what paleologists and archeologists do. Hey, think about it. A paleologist or archeologist will spend years on a dig, brushing away at dirt, m mapping out grids with the, the, the each, you know, by inches, brushing and brushing and searching and searching. And gradually, after years and years and years, Eureka, they find a fossilized bone. Or they find a shard of pottery. And it makes it into all the newspapers. A shard of somebody's pot from 5,000 years ago. Or a bit of stone that is fossilized bone has been found after years and years of effort. And those people don't whine or complain. They think they're very, very lucky. Compared to that, the excavation that we do in the preliminary practices in order to discover the wisdom of all Buddhas is easy. We shouldn't complain. Chosen <laughs> So I map us in a tat table be conjo sum de la dange te part number tapic gone so a tamna tando y cheta dembe goni teni te tabuke conjo sum de la so a tapa yina take it tom to nam de young so a mepa teni one tane geta hobic nene Jam nebati, yimbegi chana, so I may be jam ne tongue. Savo lame cutting lays, that day, tabo so I may be jam ne te, yons of the bottom ye te. Ran a thing cheva da what the carded is senna, that day tabo get a sanje chu gain to some senna yarong, sour some senna yarong. There mount at a chisung the sanje tom ye senna yarong. で、たんちげ、ちなったんてねんだぼて、そしてざぶらまけんでね。ラマててんべきじゅんせんなてね。ラミけかてんてれ。てね、え、こらなな then he ran for one toma, me bonnet tamata dala, took a padula, 
Koala Koran, Cham Yobata. Tetta on the Mazi, but she could teta, we could serve a lama taking the bateta, but on and they mepa ina. Then in Koan, Tam Mepala, Cham Gobek, Jim Sender, but that thing, eh? That teta, we get in a chin up the water, telling the body, then her, pata, mata, ten nineteen, get one at a naked tattoo tongue, then it takes your dollar. Jetting a chest in the other to travel, get one shoe, the chum you, the judging lasso, but that, ten nineteen, get one, turn a switch, take it. Now, no, Masso Bachi, Lama take it. Now, you send a ten, take a cardi chambot in the end of some big goni, tan chimaya young boss in the sungi or days, ranging, ton, ranging, ton, show, dub the nas. Rangitan, Chevarjin, Pena Dubatan, the Jingitan, Chevarjin, that Dum Dubayena, Lama Zami Mugum, Lama Lazimatabag Mugichimbo Gongo Gris, that Kadiri Sena, Ranging Ton Dubgo Guyana, Rang Dumadin, that take or a Rangitan, Ranging Ton Dubjo de Yarni, Lama Laso and Dubgo at Jim Think Kadiri Sena Tan Day. Tanke, Jigdenke, Chavan Dabo in a Tasosuke, Chavacari, but the Sosozo go good at the Tante, Jigdenke, Chava Dabo Maris, Pena Ram, Tatu, Tabat, the Tom Jinji Bacomba, Lana Mepa Tabatan, Jin Tom Jang, Tatu, Tabat, the Tom Jinji Bacomba, Lana Mepa, Coran, two ten dollar devil, deva tamba togo, big Jonathan Latin, Teta Bata, and non possum top of the Yeno possum soba dogo by Yena, Tennis Abu Lamala, Sova Zomito Tabata, Mugu Chaparji go at the Carrere Sena, Tennis Lameto Sanjeri, Go, go, Genduri, Son Tam Jori. They in the capsula tat, tetabuke, lama, lame, tok, sange, te, penatato, tetang, range, then same yeme bazoni, then in tato latini, lame, cocoson toke, yon, then the chanel tumji, ran and jogni, range, lunga, ye, some te, tabuke rangi, tomato tabuke rangi. Nello wanted to be ranking the kind of thing the young yard in Senna, that so a tongue, so a tapata, the bamboola tempe gone, it then rang and lunga yes and get debate some jet young. Then it rang in gay, touch it out the chain by chamber ye shed, wanted to turn the young go with Josella ten, then the lama and so make it so on the bottom, Mugugo gris, so on the east. And don't the palmer shape by ye. Ninji pensum genu chas, that doas him gin the tumjay day, that rig dog and doas him gay tumjay day, Namke catch up simjing and Bena can't say you. Namke catch up simjing, simjing catch up the lad and yoma be chaps in the summer. The tat tet abbe gay, then in Rodog simjing pama maji bachig the me, but the tumjay day, lad and yoma be go on the journey. Then it's uncoal and chum your body. Then chum the castle at the table, Doro, Pamar, she but the Tomjay, the young Tom Dors Doaina, Devon Dopa, Dunham Mendopa, Debig, you gave us talking to Domishipa, may give you Dunhala Parra, may by June, then the Coran Samba tongue, then the Coran Lacanda, what the Tati, Dover Castle at the time about and Doko. Chavan Tendej, Chegi Yori, Tame Teta, or Ninja Jenny, that Teta with Chava Chinki, Randon, and only Deva Lana may be a topic of Samba Yuna Yang, then it Chavang Yamba Chevalatin and Kuan Tame by a young dog, same Jin the Tamjela Hing Jay, that Tetamjela Pemba, that Deva Lana may be a doing some baby, Pensum. Jin and Dabo the Rangi Chego Gris, that Teta with Chapa in and Della Gubany Yori, Rangi Lapa Lom the Chupic Cups of La, Tinny Chancho, Tonum Chancho Gusin, want to Chuba, let Havig Gubayori. Tato one a tonic and devil Tonum Chancho sing with Nello Sug in the Tow Yomu Cups of La, Joe Gora Hinge Gora Gombat and Chambat and Hinge. Same year, Tom Jacob, the Chevy, Jotel Latin, and Devon, one egg, that 
Kona Sosa Gitta would do to begin Nibati Telet in the Yungu Yardi thing, the Rangi Nika Giton Telanto Banda were Yungu Yardi. They in the Casala Ransom Rango Hiba Ye, Nantere Neju Dumbatang Sando Messer Tobaso Tondo Reva Mitchell Ramba Tama Hiba Ye, Maju Yum. She bought a rambo, ranger, payo, some long sound to Jenny John, started and you commanded a word in the war. She got a mother, she thought I was a mother. Can happen again? The sundu keba. Long The next song um, is uh, slightly longer. It at least covers a, a page. It, it, interesting, with Tibetan texts, you just keep on going as much room as there is on the paper. If you finish in the middle of a page, then you go on and so on. So you don't waste as much paper. But in English, if, especially if you're if printing verse of any kind, you're expected to, to mostly have blank um, uh, paper. So, which is environmentally reprehensible, but anyway. So this next song also doesn't have a name, so we called it Unfailing Three Jewels because those are the first words. The first uh, stanza, also there are no stanzas in these songs. We divided them because, again, you're expected to have frequent uh, blank spaces. When it's verse, if you don't break it up, people won't read it. They actually won't. They won't read it. If there's too much print on the page, they go, oh, and then they don't read it. So you have to break it up. So we were more or less guessing uh, where we did it. We did it by meaning, sometimes by four lines if it looked. So we'll call it the first stanza, because it's a separate thing. Unfailing three jewels, refuges, and my kind root guru, thinking of you, I cry constantly. The very first word of this song, unfailing, is very, very important. It often gets translated as infallible, which implies omniscience and so on. But here, what unfailing means is something far more practical. Unfailing means that the three jewels will never let you down. To a degree, corresponding to, but far greater than, your faith in them, they really will always protect you from samsara. Their blessings are always available. They are unfailing because they don't pick and choose. They are impartial and have ability to protect, to transmit blessing. So, they are unfailing. And then in the second line, he says, and my kind root guru. Now, normally we say the three jewels and the three roots, and the guru is one of the three roots. Why does he mention the guru separately? Because the guru is our only connection to the three jewels and the three roots. Why does he apply the adjective kind? to the root guru? Aren't the three jewels kind? Of course, they're all kind. But who is the person who is kindest to you as an individual? It's your guru. Because your only access to the three jewels and the three roots is through your guru. Your guru introduces you to the three jewels and the three roots. You may never have even heard of the three jewels and the three roots before. And certainly, it is your guru who teaches you about what they are and what they do. Now, in the third line, Techen Bhava Dorji says, thinking of you, I cry constantly. Why does the thought of his guru make him weep? 
He is weeping out of gratitude. Why does he feel so much gratitude? Because of what gurus, authentic gurus, do. What is the guru's function? Why do we have gurus? The guru's function is very simple. It is to end our beginningless samsara. Because samsara is beginningless, it is also potentially endless. The intervention of our guru, specifically what our guru teaches us and are applying those teachings, causes the end of something that otherwise could never and would never have ended. When someone saves us from something, when someone gives us something that we never thought we would get, or in the case of being saved, never thought we would escape, we feel gratitude. Well, how much gratitude would we feel for somebody who does something for us that our parents haven't done and can't do, that no god or goddess can do, that no monarch or president or governor or mayor or general can do. This is something that only the guru can do. The Buddha can't do it. If the Buddha could do it, he would have done it. But the guru can do this. And that is why Tejan Bhava Dorje cries constantly. The fourth and fifth lines, he says, if you want to accomplish the greatest good for yourself and others, meditate with unbearable devotion for your guru. Now that sounds kind of odd. We know from our experience in the world that we have to help ourselves. We like to think of ourselves as self-made people. I did it by myself. And we might go on to help others, but it's us helping them. We did it. But the world and liberation are two different things. We may, to some extent, be able to accomplish mundane success using our own talents and our own effort. But if we want to do more than that, if we want to accomplish the greatest good for ourselves, liberation, Buddhahood, and the greatest good for others, again, libera their liberation and Buddhahood, we need the blessing of the guru. We can only discover what we need to discover by mixing our mind with the mind of our guru. Well, what does that mean? Because the guru is, as implied in preceding lines, the source of the three jewels and the three roots in our lives. The guru's mind is the only Buddha we know or are likely to meet. The guru's speech is our dharma. And the guru, being the foremost member of our sangha, the guru's body is the sangha. So we actually discover the Buddha within our own mind by mixing our mind and the mind of the guru, which is the Buddha, by discovering their sameness, their equality, or even identity. And that is how we purify our experience. That is how we discover the innate purity of our own bodies, speech, and minds. Therefore, this comes from prayer. And not just any old haphazard casual prayer, but prayer that is motivated by unbearable devotion. An unbearable emotion is an emotion that is so strong you can't bear to suppress it. You can't bear to ignore it. You can't bear not to express it. So unbearable devotion is devotion that wells up within you like a spring in your heart that you cannot suppress, that naturally articulates itself or expresses itself as prayer. 
he continues. Knowing these beings to be your parents, cultivate as much benevolent compassion as you can. The other key to realization, along with devotion, is compassion. And compassion is based upon understanding. The understanding that all beings are our parents. Well, what do we mean by all beings? We see a certain number of beings, but we have good reason to suspect that there are many, many more that we don't see. In truth, wherever there is space, where, whether space is finite or infinite or whatever it is, wherever there is space, there are sentient beings, seen and unseen. Wherever there are sentient beings, there are problems. Each and every sentient being has problems because we act and therefore accumulate the imprints of our actions, karma, and we are afflicted. We suffer mental affliction, which in turn causes us to act inappropriately again and then the whole thing cycles endlessly. Because this whole thing is beginningless, each and every one of these innumerable beings has been each and everything to us again and again and again. It's unimaginable how long, how vast this whole thing is. So that means that each and every being has been your father, your mother, your lover, your brother, your child, your enemy, everything to you, countless times. So however much you love the person you love most right now, you have at some point loved each and every being that much. Also, each and every one of these beings feels fundamentally as keenly as you do. Just as intensely as you want to be happy, so do they. Just as intensely as you want not to suffer, so do they. But the problem, the fundamental problem that we all have that brings about karma and kleshas and this whole cycle, is that we do not know how to be happy. Mostly, most of the time, most beings choose what will make them unhappy, thinking it will make them happy, and reject what will make them happy, thinking it will make them unhappy. And that Understanding all of that is the inspiration for compassion. Now, compassion for beings has two functions. Its present or immediate function is that the development of bodhicitta, the development of the desire to bring all beings to perfect liberation and Buddhahood, expedites our progress on the path. It fuels it. And the long-term or final result is that when we achieve the fruition, when we realize that aspiration and become Buddhas, we will be able to liberate countless beings because that was the aspiration with which we set about the path. Next, Tejan Bhavi Dorji turns to a subject very similar to what was excuse me, described in the previous song. He begins by uh, saying, when your mind recognizes itself, when your mind is not only not turned outward, ignoring the one thing we need to learn to be aware of, the mind itself, but is not only turned inward, 
but actually recognizes itself. That recognition must be fostered, must be developed. How do you develop it? Mostly with don'ts. You simply rest in that recognition and you don't do things that cause you to stray from it. Don't choose between stillness and movement. Stillness is when your mind is at rest and there are no thoughts. Movement is when thoughts are passing through the mind. Don't pick the choosy about those. Don't think that stillness is better than movement. Don't hope for clarity and fear obscurity. As soon as we hope, oh, I hope my recognition grows in clarity, I hope I don't lose it, that's, we've lost it. Don't hope too much to see. Of course, you're meditating because you want to see your mind's nature. And that causes us to get all cranked up. Yeah, I got to see it. I got to see it. Well, that won't do it. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to unbind our minds. Like in the previous song, the analogy of, or in Rinpoche's explanation of it, a bundle of grass with the, the, what's holding it together cut and it just flops. What we're looking for is unbound, ordinary cognition. Ordinary mind. Just what the mind is of itself without any kind of alteration. So therefore, he says, unbound ordinary cognition means unaltered natural cognition. It means just that. Not, don't try to mess with it. Don't try to improve it. Just don't be distracted. It is unbound, left to itself, through mere presence. How do we cut that cord? Through, through remaining present in mere awareness, bare awareness of the present moment of experience. But this is work because we have, it's work not because it's unnatural, but because we have the habit of doing everything else. Throughout beginning of samsara, we have been and done everything except one thing. We have never <laughs> looked at our mind. We've looked everywhere else, we've done everything else, but we've done everything we can to distract ourselves from that one thing. So therefore it takes diligence, and that's why he says, cultivate this through constant diligence. Can <laughs> So then the final uh, two stanzas, um, if isolated by meaning, one of them is general advice, things we need to keep in mind regardless of our style or level of practice. First one is we need to know or remember that we never complete our inexhaustible samsaric schemes. We are constantly coming up with projects and ideas for things we can do. And the problem with this is twofold. One problem is that it distracts us from looking at our minds. And the other problem is that we mistake happiness with the achievement of short-term goals. So we, we come up with something and then we think, I'll be happy when I do this. And then we do it. And then we're still not happy because we want to want. And so then we come up with something else. If left to itself, this scheming is inexhaustible. There's no such thing as retirement from samsara. 
will always come up with something. So therefore, he advises, it's best to let go of craving. At some point, you simply have to say, enough. You have to cultivate contentment. Without contentment, satisfaction is impossible. If you want dharma, have fortitude. If you want to achieve awakening, you have to work hard. It's very simple. There's no replacement for hard work. And about, you know, conduct, behavior, fear wrongdoing. There's one thing we should be afraid of, and that's doing bad things. No matter who we are, no matter what we think we've experienced or achieved, if we do bad things, we're going to experience bad things, and we don't want that. So give it up as much as you can. And then he concludes, this was written by old Barbara Dorje for the disciples Legden and Tamdrin to encourage diligent accomplishment. I offer my aspiration that your thoughts accord with Dharma and that you be without obstacles. <laughs> ตัวเองดูกับสลักขาเสตตําจิตตาสุสุกยูเลนยุกมยุกสิงเกนเตตะนี่ลามาเตละซิมเจละญิงเจเมชัมบะเมนงเกขะจะกุซิมเจตําเ
when someone achieves uh, awakening, achieves what we call the Dharmakaya, they um, achieve all three bodies, the Trikaya, because the Samogakaya and Nirmanakaya are natural um, displays of uh, the Dharmakaya. So that means that if you're praying to somebody who has achieved the Dharmakaya, their uh, blessings are inherently infinite. The attributes of the Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya are uh, inconceivably great, which means that their blessings are really uh, infinite. The degree to which we receive these blessings depends not on any fluctuation in the Guru's compassion or on any difference in degree in the Guru's compassion for one being as opposed to another. It depends entirely upon our own degree of devotion. And this is why at the beginning of the second song, Bharadarji begins by saying, thinking of you, thinking of his kind root guru, I cry constantly. I cry constantly, if we think about it, describes all three types of faith. The faith of wonderment, the faith of aspiration, and the faith of a certain belief. When someone has that type of devotion, that type of faith, it is utterly impossible that their guru's blessing not enter their hearts. It has never, ever happened that somebody had that type and that level of devotion and did not receive a corresponding blessing. These awakened beings to whom we pray, they were born to do this. They did not take birth as we did out of karmic compulsion. They chose where they were born. And their purpose in choosing to take birth was so that they be able to bless us, teach us and to bless us. That's their job. That's what they do. That's what they're for. So it depends on our devotion. However, on our own side, we need to beware of fakery and pretense. Nowadays, um, we're very clever at learning how to mimic devotion. We actually almost practice this mimicry. We learn to bow and scrape and kowtow. We almost never stand up straight around our gurus because we think it will make us look more devoted the more bent and hunched our spines are. We've learned to cry at the appropriate moments or to open our eyes wide and stare as if with some tremendous realization born of devotion. Unfortunately for all of us fakers, Buddhas and bodhisattvas uh, are on the job and they know that we're just pretentious actors. We could stop there. So nam de tan de seng ma ne don ne be Ba 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.